tomorrow, and his challenge and question goes to Dr. Ali. We start your question now. Jesse? Is um, Shabir, by what means do you use to measure the truth of your absolute world views over those of Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, atheists, etc.? If your account of reality is closer to the truth than either Dr. Costa's or mine and everyone else in the, in the world who are not Muslim, where is your reality measuring stick which would convince all of us here tonight that what you are saying is absolutely true? You can also come here. Please. Thank you for that question, Dr. DiCarlo. I wouldn't uh, answer from the point of view of uh, absolute truth, but I would answer from the point of view of my own relative experience. Uh, like all of us, uh, I have uh, a certain history. I've been educated in a certain way. I've been brought up in a certain way. I've had certain experiences in life that have led me to where I am now and what I believe now. Uh, but having said that, it seems to me from my uh, brief survey of the world's religions that uh, if there is a religion to pick, then to me the religion is Islam. Uh, going outside of the religious sphere and to think about atheism and other uh, non-beliefs that are out there, or, or, or non-theistic beliefs that are out there, again I believe that Islam makes uh, sense. Some of the problems that Dr. DiCarlo mentioned here today with regards to belief in God, knowledge of God and his omnipotence, his, uh, um, his uh, uh, benevolence and so on, I do not see these to be problems in the Islamic conception uh, of, uh, of faith in God. Uh, the Quran in Islam I believe to be one of the most motivating factors for me. When I study the Quran, uh, I become entirely impressed that this is a revelation from the Almighty God. One of the things that uh, confirm this for me in, in modern times is uh, the uh, noticing that uh, there are certain mathematical patterns in the Quran that go beyond the mere meaning of the text. And this is a modern discovery. Prior to the age of the computer, we were not able to do these studies on the computer. Some people uh, have uh, done studies like this uh, with regards to the Bible. There was Ivan Panin, and more recently, Michael Drosnin and uh, Jeffrey Sat Satinover. But uh, all of these studies have been discarded and discounted by those who have uh, reviewed them independently. In the case of the Quran, on the other hand, there are many uh, numerical correspondences between things, between numbers of verses, between numbers of chapters, numbers of words, numbers of letters. And it's forming such a tight-knit composition that it is clear that whoever authored this book uh, is, it has a very deep interest in numbers has a, a, a sharp mind that could keep track of the numbers over the 23 years over which the Quran was being revealed a piece at a time in a wide variety of circumstances and didn't tell anybody about this until we can discover it only now. To me, this is the mind of God behind the Quran that we're now discovering. For example, one of these aspects is the number of, of times words occur in the Quran that are meaningful in terms of the numbers and in terms of each other. For example, tonight our debate is about Jesus. The Quran says that Jesus is like Adam. And the Quran means that, that but they're both created by God. But there is another way in which Jesus is like Adam in the Quran. Each name, Jesus and Adam, occurs in the Quran 25 times. And if only once do they occur in the same verse, and another time in the same chapter. To think of the other 23 occurrences scattered in a variety of chapters in the Quran, some chapters mention Adam but do not mention Jesus, some mention Jesus but not Adam, and to keep count of the Prophet now reciting a piece at a time over 23 years in a variety of circumstances, how does he remember how many times he said Adam and how many times he said Jesus? More than this. Uh, the Quran mentions man, Rajul, 24 times, and Imra, a woman, also 24 times. The Quran mentions uh, Satan, an angel, Satan 68 times, angel 68 times as well. The Quran contrasts this life with the life hereafter. Dunya in the Quran occurs 115 times, Akhirah, the life hereafter, also 115 times. What accounts for this phenomenon? 
what are the chances that you pick up a book, any book, and you ask yourself, how many times does this book mention the word day? Now, any book will tell you that there are 365 and a quarter days in a year. Now, and, and every child almost knows that. But what are the chances that the book mentions the word day exactly 365 times? The chance is very remote. The Quran does precisely that. If one were to count the word yawm in Arabic without any suffixes in the Quran, it occurs exactly 365 times. This is one part of a larger phenomenon in which we see that the Quran measures things. Things are measured in the Quran and the Quran actually draws attention to this. The last verse of the 72nd chapter says that God has measured everything numerically. No one realized at the time that this was actually about the Quran as well. In fact, there are things in the Quran that are measured numerically and we're only discovering that now. As Adam Smith said in the world of econ economics, there's a, there is a, an invisible hand guiding everything. To me, there is the invisible hand of God and the mind of God guiding the revelation and the eventual compilation of the Quran as we have it now. Thank you very much.